We asked Dr. Paul how we could get the yoke of increasing government regulation off our necks. Here is his answer. You're talking about the regulations, Burton. Right. Yeah. Well, we'd have to change the whole nature of government. Uh, of course, the simple answer is if we would go back to the uh, instructions in the Constitution, only the Congress can write law. The executive branch nor the judicial branch aren't, aren't allowed to write law. But just think of the thousands and thousands of pages of, uh, of regulations in the uh, Federal Register and think of the thousands of pages in the uh, tax code. This is all... Uh, this is all done, as far as I'm concerned, Ill illegally, because the Congress is supposed to, to write, write these laws. Congress still could stop that. They could have oversight. There's even a provision that says that if, some, if, a con if, if the executive branch issues regulations, we can actually rescind those. But it rarely happens of the tens of thousands of regulations that are written, maybe once or twice uh, Congress has acted to do something. So you have to have a whole change in attitude, which means that the people then have to demand, uh, you know, restraint and send only people up here that will do something about uh, less regulations and starting to deregulate. But uh, as soon as you come up with something that says, oh, well, yeah, I think you're, what you're saying is right. But we do need regulations on the environment. We do need regulations on this. And they'll always have, have an exception. And they don't have any confidence that uh, many of these problems that we try to solve with regulations can be solved in the free market. People don't have the right to injure other people, and you don't have a right to injure the environment, and you don't have a right to defraud people, and, and people do have an obligation to go bankrupt if they can't be, uh, if they're not solvent, and they don't have a right to be bailed out. So it's a whole attitude change. Uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe there will be some improvement, but I don't expect that problem to go away, and therefore I expect our economy to get weaker. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paul, we noted a, a comment made by Bob Wenzel of EconomicPolicyJournal.com. <clears throat> he noted that we have, quote, a global anger uh, against government in general, and kind of a corollary to that is the Rasmussen poll said 61% of Americans say we're on the wrong path. One of our uh, free market radio listeners, uh, Ms. Whitney Wogan from Colorado, said both Republicans and Democrats have both created bigger government. And asked, what do you see as the most viable path for getting what they would call substantive change? And I guess the punchline is, is it a third party? Hmm. Well, I, th I wish all third parties well. Even during the last presidential campaign, I got all the alternative parties, the, the non-Republicans and Democrats, just hoping to say that if you're a progressive Democrat, uh, don't trust Obama. If you're a libertarian conservative, don't uh, don't trust the Republicans. But it, it just doesn't work. I mean, the system is so biased against alternatives. It's hard to get on ballots. Uh, you can't get into debates. Uh, they mock what people do, and you don't have the credibility that you need. So. I think they should keep trying, but it, it is going to be very, very difficult. I, I think this, the, uh, the change comes philosophically. Um, I, I think of the uh, comparison about, you know, in the 30s when uh, we had the Depression, they blamed free enterprise, the free markets, and the gold standard for the Depression. And Keynes came into vogue at that time, so Keynesianism economics uh, was a revolutionary answer to these problems. So, uh, but it wasn't a Republican or Democratic issue. Uh, it was originally Democrat and under Roosevelt. But eventually, by the 1970s, Nixon made an important statement. He said, we're all Keynesians now, and we all have been. And that's what they're doing. We have to have a change in attitude and an understanding on how these changes come about. And I think we're seeing the transition. I think people have given up on conventional government, and they are angry, and they're sick and tired of it all. Our biggest job, I believe, is to have a positive alternative so that they understand what free market economics are all about. It's not the free enterprise promoted by the Chamber of Commerce. It, it has something to do with understanding, uh, you know, voluntary contracts and, and sound money and a very limited government. 
Uh, so that's, uh, I, I think we're moving in that direction. I've been very encouraged by the reception I get on college campuses, and many young people are very positive toward what uh, we're talking about. Is it realistic to think that we can return to the principle of nullification, which uh, was a bedrock of our original federalism? You know, I think so. I'm, uh, I, I'm sort of optimistic on that, but might not, maybe not in the context of, of uh, having it uh, legalized. That is, the Congress is going to pass something to restate that principle, and the president will say, yes, uh, if states don't want to do it, we're not going to send in the troops. But, but in, in many ways, I think it'll be something like what's going on with marijuana right now. You know, for decades, everybody tolerated the federal government coming in and just coming down with a heavy hand and putting pre people in prison with the uh, use of just a small amount of marijuana. And, you know, things are starting to shift right now. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, an interesting idea about throwing the state's rights at you, which uh, is, a, is a bad term for many people, especially on the left, to the left and say, look, do you want uh, states' rights on uh, the right of California to write these laws? So just think how much marijuana is being produced in this country today. I mean, it is a big business. So it's almost like it's just overwhelmed, you know, the federal federal laws. So in a way, it was, it's been nullified. So I think more of that's going to happen. If we get into dire straits economically, I think the the underground economy uh, isn't just going to persist. It's going to grow by leaps and bounds. And people just saying, I'm trying to survive, and I'm going to trade my goods and services, and I'm going to survive, and I'm not, I'm not uh, going to pay any attention to the federal government anymore. What happens when the federal government can't send any more money to the states? What if our dollar gets so weak that they can't bail out California? Something has to give, and one thing is it's going to be a de facto nullification, and they're just going to walk away and say, we're going to take care of our own business. And that could be very hectic. It could be dangerous, but in many ways, it could be healthy, too. It could be a healthy, uh, you know, peaceful correction rather than going through the throes of a, of a violent uh, revolution. You know, I don't think that's necessary. Just, just get, at this point, someday the people and the local governments uh, will just ignore the federal government. And that will probably come when the money that they print has no more value and it doesn't function well. Well, kind of to, to pick up on that, I know you you're, would like to see certainly an, uh, an orderly unwinding of, of what is essentially a stranglehold that government now has on really every aspect of our life, our money and banking and schools and, and most recently our health care. In addition to what you just outlined, what are some of the baby steps and, and particularly um, how could we begin to orderly, in an orderly way, unwind the biggest kind of fiscal burdens that we have, such as Social Security and Medicare? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, there's, I think there's always answers for transitions. For instance, in Social Security, um, I actually, you know, though I don't think that's a constitutional program, I'm not for tomorrow closing it down. Uh, matter of fact, I have some bills in which would isolate those funds. Those funds would not be spent in the general revenues. There will be would be accounts, and and it would be treated more like an insurance program. But the, the only way that would work is if you had massive cuts elsewhere, because we need that cash flow to pay for the bills in Afghanistan and different places. So you'd have to have a change in foreign policy and, and cut elsewhere in order to salvage the Social Security system. The likelihood that that happened. Excuse me. Uh, happening is not uh, not very good. But I think in almost every problem we have, if you always allow a loophole for people to uh, go on their own uh, in education, if we uh, banned homeschooling and private schooling, that would be the utter disaster. Right now, homeschooling continues to grow. The public school system gets more expensive, and the quality goes down. So we have to protect the privilege of opting out. Uh, I have a bill in that allow, legalizes competing currencies where we don't have to deal with the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve notes, but we can use constitutional money and not have to worry about going to jail for using gold and silver as, as legal tender. In, ed, in medicine, uh, I have a bill, uh, since this medical uh, reform package was passed, uh, what's the most important thing that we could do uh, to allow some competition, and that is to remove the mandate and to 
you know, put more emphasis on these medical savings accounts where you can get out of the system, pay your own bills, and at least get a tax benefit from it. I think if there was always a free market option where you could get out of the government programs, at least that would give us hope. And then if the government does mess up like we anticipate, then uh, there'll be a lot of people in place and those numbers would just grow and there could be a transition.